Hello, and welcome to Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, the podcast. Written by Eliezer Yudkowsky, read by Inyash Brodsky, based on the works of J.K. Rowling. Second half of Chapter 27, Empathy. There is a main hallway running through the middle of Hogwarts' second floor on the north-south axis, and near the center of this hallway there is an opening into a short corridor which goes a dozen paces before turning at a right angle, making an L-shape, and then goes a dozen paces more before it ends at a bright, wide window, looking out from three stories upon the light drizzle falling over the east grounds of Hogwarts. Standing by the window, you can hear nothing of the main hallway, and no one in the hallway would hear what went on by the window. If you think there is anything odd about this, you haven't been in Hogwarts very long. Four boys in red-trimmed robes are laughing, and a boy in green-trimmed robes is screaming and grabbing frantically onto the edges of the opened window with his hands, as the four boys make as though to push him out. It's just a joke, of course, and besides, a fall from that height wouldn't kill a wizard. All good fun. If you think there's anything odd about this... What are you doing? Says a sixth boy's voice. The four boys in red-trimmed robes spin around with sudden starts, and the boy in green-trimmed robes frantically pushes himself away from the window and falls to the floor, face streaked with tears. Oh, says the most handsome of the boys in red-trimmed robes, sounding relieved. It's you. Hey, Lessie, you know who this is? There isn't any answer from the boy on the floor, who's trying to get his sniffling under control, and the boy in the red-trimmed robes draws back his leg for a kick. Stop it, shouts the sixth boy. The boy in the red-trimmed robes wobbles as he aborts the kick. Um, do you know who this is? The sixth boy's breathing sounds strange. Lezith Lestrange, he says, his breath coming in short pants. And he didn't do anything to my parents. He was five years old. Neville Longbottom stared at the four huge, fifth-year bullies in front of him, trying very hard to control his trembling. He should have just told Harry Potter no. Why are you defending him? said the handsome one, slowly, sounding puzzled with the first hints of offense. He's a Slytherin, and a Lestrange. He's a boy who lost his parents. I know how that is. He didn't know where the words had come from. It sounded too cool, like something Harry Potter would say. The trembling went on, though. Who do you think you are? said the handsome one, starting to sound angry. I am Neville, the last scion of the noble and most ancient house of Longbottom. Neville couldn't say it. I think he's a traitor, said one of the other Gryffindors, and there was a sudden sinking sensation in Neville's stomach. He'd known it. He'd just known it. Harry Potter had been wrong after all. Bullies wouldn't stop only because Neville Longbottom told them to stop. The handsome one took a step forward, and the other three followed. So that's how it is for you, Neville said, amazed at how steady his voice was. It doesn't matter to you if it's Lesoth Lestrange or Neville Longbottom. Lesoth Lestrange let out a sudden gasp from where he was lying on the floor. Evil is evil, snarled the same boy who'd spoken before. And if you're friends with evil, you're evil too. The four took another step forward. Lesoth rose, wobbling, to his feet. His face was gray, and he took a few steps forward and leaned against the wall, and didn't say anything. His eyes were fixed on the turn in the hallway, the way out. Friends, Neville said. Now his voice was going up a bit in pitch. Yes, I have friends. One of them's the boy who lived. A couple of the Gryffindors looked suddenly worried. The handsome one didn't flinch. Harry Potter isn't here, and if he was... I don't think he'd like to see a Longbottom defending a Lestrange. And the Gryffindors took another long step forward, and behind them, Lesoth crept along the wall, waiting for his chance. Neville swallowed, and raised his right hand with his thumb and forefinger pressed together. He shut his eyes, because Harry Potter had made him promise not to peek. If this didn't work, he was never trusting anyone again. His voice came out surprisingly clear, considering... Harry James Potter Evans Varus. Harry James Potter Evans Varus. Harry James Potter Evans Varus. By the debt that you owe me, and the power of your true name, I summon you. I open the way for you. I call upon you to manifest yourself before me. Neville snapped his fingers. 
And then Neville opened his eyes. Lysoth Lestrange was staring at him. The four Gryffindors were staring at him. The handsome one started to chuckle, and that set off the other three. Was Harry Potter supposed to step around the corner or something? Ah, oh, looks like you've been stood up. The handsome one took a menacing step forward toward Neville. The other three followed in lockstep. Ahem, said Harry Potter from behind them, leaning against the wall by the window in the dead end of the hallway where nobody could possibly have gotten to without being seen. If watching people scream always felt this good, Neville could sort of understand why people became bullies. Harry Potter stalked forward, placing himself between the Sothless Strange and the others. He swept his icy gaze across the boys in red-trimmed robes, and then his eyes came to rest on the handsome one, the ringleader. Mr. Carl Sloper, said Harry Potter, I believe I have comprehended the situation fully. If Lysoth Lestrange has ever committed a single evil himself, rather than being born to the wrong parents, the fact is not known to you. If I am mistaken in this, Mr. Sloper, I suggest you inform me at once. Neville saw the fear and awe on the other boys' faces. He was feeling it himself. Harry had claimed it would all be a trick, but how could it be? But he's a Lestrange. He's a boy who lost his parents, Harry said, his voice growing even colder. This time, all three of the other Gryffindors flinched. So, you saw that Neville didn't want you tormenting an innocent boy on behalf of the Longbottoms. This failed to move you. If I tell you that the boy who lived also thinks you are in the wrong, that what you did today was a terrible mistake, does that make a difference? The ringleader took a step toward Harry. The others did not follow him. Carl, one of them said, swallowing. Maybe we should go. They say you're going to be the next Dark Lord, the ringleader said, staring at Harry. A grin crossed Harry Potter's face. They also say I'm secretly betrothed to Geneva Weasley and there's a prophecy about us conquering France. The smile faded. Since you're determined to force the issue, Mr. Carl Sloper, let me make things clear. Leave Lesoth alone. I will know if you don't. So Lessie snarked to you. Sure, said Harry Potter dryly. And he also told me what you did today after you left Charms class, in a private, secluded place where no one could see you, with a certain Hufflepuff girl wearing a white ribbon in her hair. The ringleader's jaw dropped in shock. Eep! said one of the other Gryffindors in a high-pitched voice, and spun on his heels and ran around the corner. His footsteps rapidly pattered away and faded. And then there were six. Ah, said Harry Potter, there goes a slightly intelligent young man. The rest of you could stand to learn from Bertram Kirk's example before you get into, shall we say, trouble. Are you threatening to snark on us? said the handsome Gryffindor, his voice trying to be angry and rather wavering. Bad things happen to snarkers. The other two Gryffindors started slowly moving back. Harry Potter started laughing. Oh, you did not just say that. Are you really trying to intimidate me? Me? Now, honestly, do you think you're scarier than Peregrine Derrick, Severus Snape, or for that matter, you know who? Even the ringleader flinched at that. Harry Potter raised a hand, fingers poised, and all three of the Gryffindors leapt backwards, and one of them blurted, Don't! See, this is where I snap my fingers, and you become part of a hilariously amusing story that will be told with much nervous laughter at dinner tonight. But the thing is... People I trust keep telling me not to do that. Professor McGonagall told me I was taking the easy way out of everything. And Professor Quirrell says I need to learn how to lose. So you remember that story where I let myself get beaten up by some older Slytherins? We could do that. You could bully me for a while, and I could let you. Only you remember that part at the end where I tell my many, many friends inside the school not to do anything about it? This time we'll skip that part. So go ahead. Bully me. Harry Potter stepped forward, his arms opened wide in invitation. The three Gryffindors broke and ran, and Neville had to sidestep quickly to avoid getting run over. There was silence as their footsteps faded, and then more silence after that. And then there were three. Harry Potter drew a deep breath, then exhaled. Whew! How are you doing, Neville? Neville's voice came out in a high-pitched squeak. Okay, that was really cool. A grin flashed across Harry Potter's face. 
You were pretty cool too, you know. Neville knew that Harry Potter was just saying that, trying to make him feel good, and it still started a warm glow inside his chest. Harry turned toward Lesoth Lestrange. Are you okay, Lestrange? Said Neville before Harry could open his mouth. Now there was something you didn't expect to find yourself saying, ever. Lesoth Lestrange turned slowly and stared at Neville, his face tight, no longer crying, tears glistening as they dried. You think you know how it is? Said Lesoth, his voice high and shaking. You think you know? My parents are in Azkaban. I try not to think about it, and they always remind me. They think it's great that Mother is in there, in the cold and the dark, with the Dementor sucking away her life. I wish I was like Harry Potter. At least his parents aren't hurting. My parents are always hurting, every second of every day. I wish I was like you. At least you can see your parents sometimes. At least you know they loved you. If Mother ever loved me, the Dementors will have eaten that thought by now. Neville's eyes were wide with shock. He hadn't expected this. Lesoth turned to Harry Potter, whose eyes were full of horror. Lesoth flung himself on the floor in front of Harry Potter, touched his forehead to the ground, and whispered, Help me, Lord. There was an awful silence. Neville couldn't think of a single thing to say, and from the naked shock on Harry's face, he couldn't think of anything either. They say you can do anything. Please, please, my lord, get my parents out of Azkaban. I'll be your loyal servant forever. My life will be yours, and my death as well, only please. Lasoth, Harry said, his voice breaking. Lasoth, I can't. I can't really do things like that. It's all just stupid tricks. It's not. I saw it. The stories are true. You can. Harry swallowed. Lesoth, I set the whole thing up with Neville. We planned it all out in advance. Ask him. They had, though Harry hadn't said how he was going to do any of it. When Lesoth looked up from the floor, his face was ghastly, and his voice came out in a shriek that hurt Neville's ears. You son of a mudblood! You could get her out! You just won't! I got down on my knees and begged you, and you still hold help! I should have known! You're the boy who lived! You think she belongs there! I can't! It's not a question of what I want! I don't have the power! Lesoth rose to his feet and spat at the floor in front of Harry, and then turned and walked away. When he was around the corner, the sound of his feet sped up, and as they faded, Neville thought he heard a single sob. And then there were two. Neville looked at Harry. Harry looked at Neville. Wow. He didn't seem very grateful for being rescued. He thought I could help him, Harry said, his voice hoarse. He had hope for the first time in years. Neville swallowed and said it. I'm sorry. What? said Harry, sounding totally confused. I wasn't very grateful when you helped me. Every single thing you said was completely right. No, it wasn't. They simultaneously gave brief, sad smiles, each condescending to the other. I know this wasn't real. I know I couldn't have done anything if you hadn't been there. But thanks for letting me pretend. Give me a break. Harry had turned from Neville and was staring out the window at the gloomy clouds. A completely ridiculous thought came to Neville. Are you feeling guilty because you can't get Leslie's parents out of Azkaban? No. A few seconds went by. Yes. You're silly. I am aware of this. Do you have to do literally anything anyone asks you? The boy who lived turned back and looked at Neville again. Do? No. Feel guilty about not doing? Yes. Neville was having trouble finding words. Once the Dark Lord died, Belchix Black was literally the most evil person in the entire world, and that was before she went to Azkaban. She tortured my mother and father into insanity because she wanted to find out what happened to the Dark Lord. I know. I get that, but... No, you don't. She had a reason for doing that, and my parents were both oars. It's not even close to the worst thing she's ever done. Neville's voice was shaking. Even so, said the boy who lived, his eyes distant as they stared off into somewhere else, some other place that Neville couldn't imagine. 
There might be some incredibly clever solution that makes it possible to save everyone and let them all live happily ever after. And if only I was smart enough, I would have thought of it by now. You have problems. You think you ought to be with Lazarus Change thinks you are. Yeah, that pretty much nails it. Every time someone cries out in prayer and I can't answer, I feel guilty about not being God. Neville didn't quite understand that, but... That doesn't sound good. Harry sighed. I understand that I have a problem, and I know what I need to do to solve it, alright? I'm working on it. Harry watched Neville leave. Of course, Harry hadn't said what the solution was. The solution, obviously, was to hurry up and become God. Neville's footsteps moved off and soon could no longer be heard. And then there was one. Ahem, said Severus Snape's voice from directly behind him. Harry let out a small scream and instantly hated himself. Slowly, Harry turned around. The tall, greasy man in the spotted robes was leaning against the wall in the same position Harry had occupied. A fine invisibility cloak, Potter. Much is explained. Oh, bloody crap. And perhaps I've been in Dumbledore's company too long, but I cannot help but wonder if that is the Cloak of Invisibility. Harry immediately turned into someone who'd never heard of the Cloak of Invisibility and who was exactly as smart as Harry thought Severus thought Harry was. Oh, possibly. I trust you realize the implications if it is. Severus's voice was condescending. You have no idea what I'm talking about, do you, Potter? A rather clumsy try at fishing. Professor Quirrell had remarked over their lunch that Harry really needed to conceal his state of mind better than putting on a blank face when someone discussed a dangerous topic, and had explained about one-level deception, two-level deceptions, and so on. So either Severus was, in fact, modeling Harry as a one-level player, which made Severus himself two-level, and Harry's three-level move had been successful, or Severus was a four-level player and wanted Harry to think the deception had been successful. Harry, smiling, had asked Professor Quirrell what level he played at, and Professor Quirrell, also smiling, had responded, One level higher than you. So you were watching this whole time, said Harry. Disillusionment, I think it's called. A thin smile. It would have been foolish of me to take the slightest risk that you came to harm. And you wanted to see the results of your test firsthand. So, am I like my father? A strange, sad expression came over the man, one that looked foreign to his face. I should sooner say, Harry Potter, that you resemble... Severus stopped short. He stared at Harry. The strange called you a son of a mudblood, Severus said slowly. It didn't seem to bother you much. Harry furrowed his eyebrows. Not under those circumstances, no. You just helped him. His eyes were intent on Harry. And he threw it back in your face. Surely that isn't something you just forgive. He'd just been through a pretty harrowing experience. And I don't think being rescued by first years helped his pride much either. I suppose it was easy enough to forgive, Severus said, and his voice was odd. Since Lestrange means nothing to you, just some strange Slytherin. If it was a friend, perhaps, you would have felt far more injured by what he'd said. If he were a friend, all the more reason to forgive him. There was a long silence. Harry felt, and he couldn't have said why or from where, that the air was filling up with a dreadful tension, like water rising and rising and rising. Then Severus smiled, looking suddenly relaxed once more, and all the tension vanished. You are a very forgiving person, Severus said, still smiling. I suppose your stepfather, Michael Veras Evans, was the one who taught it to you. More like Dad's science fiction and fantasy collection. Sort of my fifth parent, really. I've lived the lives of all the characters in all my books, and all their mighty wisdom thunders in my head. Somewhere in there was someone like Lasoth, I expect, though I couldn't say who. It wasn't hard to put myself in his shoes, and it was my books that told me what to do about it, too. The good guys forgive. Severus gave a light, amused laugh. I'm afraid I wouldn't know much about what good people do. Harry looked at him. That was kind of sad, actually. I'll lend you some novels with good people in them, if you like. I should like to ask your advice about something. I know of another fifth-year Slytherin who's been bullied by Gryffindors, 
He was wooing a beautiful muggle-born girl who came across him being bullied and tried to rescue him. And he called her a mudblood, and that was the end for them. He apologized many times, but she never forgave him. Have you any thoughts for what he could have said or done to win from her the forgiveness you gave Lestrange? Mmm, based on only that information, I'm not sure he was the main one who had a problem. I'd have told him not to date someone that incapable of forgiveness. Suppose they'd gotten married. Can you imagine life in that household? There was a pause. Oh, but she could forgive. Why, afterwards she went off and became the girlfriend of the bully. Tell me, why would she forgive the bully and not the bullied? Harry shrugged. At a wild yes, because the bully had hurt someone else very badly, and the bullied had hurt her just a little. And to her, that felt far more unforgivable somehow. Or, not to put too fine a point on it, was the bully handsome? Or, for that matter, rich? There was another pause. Yes to both. And there you have it. Not that I've ever been through high school myself, but my books give me to understand that there's a certain kind of teenage girl who'll be outraged by a single insult if the boy is plain or poor, yet who can somehow find room in her heart to forgive a rich and handsome boy his bullying. She was shallow, in other words. Tell whoever it was that she wasn't worthy of him and he needs to get over it and move on. And next time, date girls who are deep instead of pretty. Severus stared at Harry in silence, his eyes glittering. The smile had faded, and though Severus's face twitched, it did not return. Harry was starting to feel a bit nervous. Um, not that I've got any experience in the area myself, obviously, but I think that's what a wise advisor from my books would say. There was more silence, and more glittering. It was probably a good time to change the subject. So, did I pass your test, whatever it was? I think that there should be no more conversations between us, Potter, and you would be exceedingly wise never to speak of this one. Harry blinked. Would you mind telling me what I did wrong? You offended me, and I no longer trust your cunning. Harry stared at Severus, rather taken aback. But you have given me well-meant advice, and so I will give you true advice in return. His voice was almost perfectly steady like a string stretched almost perfectly horizontal, despite the massive weight hanging from its middle by a million tons of tension pulling at either end. You almost died today, Potter. In the future, never share your wisdom with anyone unless you know exactly what you are both talking about. Harry's mind finally made the connection. You were that! Harry's mouth snapped shut as the almost died part sank in, two seconds too late. Yes. I was. And the terrible tension flooded back into the room like water pressurized at the bottom of the ocean. Harry couldn't breathe. Lose. Now. I didn't know, Harry whispered. I'm sorry. No, said Severus. Just that one word. Harry stood there in silence, his mind frantically searching for options. Severus stood between him and the window, which was a real pity, because a fall from that height wouldn't kill a wizard. Your books betrayed you, Potter, said Severus, still in that voice stretched tight by a million tons of pull. They did not tell you the one thing that you needed to know. You cannot learn from stories what it is like to lose the one you love. That is something you could never understand without feeling it yourself. My father, Harry whispered. It was his best guess, the one thing that might save him. My father tried to protect you from the bullies. A ghastly smile stretched across Severus's face, and the man moved toward Harry. And past him. Goodbye, Potter, said Severus, not looking back on his way out. We shall have little to say to each other from today on. And at the corner, the man stopped, and without turning, spoke one final time. Your father was the bully, and what your mother saw in him was something I never did understand until this day. He left. Harry turned and walked toward the window. His shaking hands went onto the ledge. Never give anyone wise advice unless you know exactly what you're both talking about. Got it. Harry stared out at the clouds and the light drizzle for a while. The window looked out on the east grounds and it was afternoon, so if the sun was visible through the clouds at all, Harry couldn't see it. 
His hands had stopped shaking, but there was a tight feeling in Harry's chest, like it was being compressed by metal bands. So his father had been a bully, and his mother had been shallow. Maybe they'd grown up later. Good people like Professor McGonagall did seem to think the world of them, and it might not be only because they were heroic martyrs. Of course, that was scant consolation when you were eleven and about to turn into a teenager and wondering what sort of teenager you might become. So very terrible. So very sad. Such an awful life, Harry led. Learning that his genetic parents hadn't been perfect, why, he ought to spend a while moping about that, feeling sorry for himself. Maybe he could complain to Lysoth Lestrange. Harry had read about Dementors. Cold and darkness surrounded them, and fear. They sucked away all your happy thoughts, and in that absence, all your worst memories rose to the surface. He could imagine himself in Lasoth's shoes, knowing that his parents were in Azkaban for life, that place from which no one had ever escaped. And Lasoth would be imagining himself in his mother's place, in the cold and the darkness and the fear, alone with all of her worst memories, even in her dreams, every second of every day. For an instant, Harry imagined his own mum and dad in Azkaban, with the Dementors sucking out their life, draining away the happy memories of their love for him. Just for an instant, before his imagination blew a fuse and called an emergency shutdown and told him never to imagine that again. Was it right to do that to anyone, even the second most evil person in the world? No, said the wisdom in Harry's books, not if there's any other way any other way at all. And unless the wizarding justice system was as perfect as their prisons, and that sounded rather improbable, all things considered, somewhere in Azkaban was a person who was entirely innocent, and probably more than one. There was a burning sensation in Harry's throat and moisture gathering in his eyes, and he wanted to teleport all of Azkaban's prisoners to safety and call down fire from the sky and blast that terrible place down to bedrock. But he couldn't because he wasn't God. And Harry remembered what Professor Quirrell had said beneath the starlight. Sometimes, when this flawed world seems unusually hateful, I wonder whether there might be some other place, far away, where I should have been. But the stars are so very, very far away, and I wonder what I would dream about if I slept for a long, long time. Right now, this flawed world seemed unusually hateful. And Harry couldn't understand Professor Quirrell's words. It might have been an alien that had spoken, or an artificial intelligence. Something built along such different lines from Harry that his brain couldn't be forced to operate in that mode. You couldn't leave your home planet while it still contained a place like Azkaban. You had to stay and fight. End chapter 27. Next week I'm taking off for Thanksgiving, so there won't be a new episode. I'll have a little something, but we'll resume regular updates the week after. Thank you to the following people. Sever Snape by Brian Jones. Lasoth Lestrange, read by Eric Scow. Neville by Adam Hartel. Carl Sloper by Bram Bucker. This chapter's original text, production notes, and attribution links along with archives and much more, can be found at hpmorpodcast.com. If you would like to learn more about the art of rationality, please visit lesswrong.com, an online community of aspiring rationalists founded by Eliezer Yudkowsky. Some sound effects used are courtesy of the Free Sound Project. The music used is Catch That Goblin by Skaven. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. 